Kia ora. Hey, uh, I feel like I know most of the people in the room tonight. Yeah, I know Mitchell. Yeah, that's good. If I don't know you, or if you don't know me, my name's Nathan. I have a wonderful family. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, Three-year-old daughter named Bridie. She is the bomb. Uh, she, yeah, she's just, she's just killing it, killing life. So good. Uh, Ashley is my wife. She's great. Also, she's very good. Yeah, anybody, any fan, Ashley fans in the room? Yeah. I had a feeling, I had a feeling. Um, okay, so I get to do two things. Uh, everyone say two things. All right, here we go. Uh, uh, when I work at church, one of the things is music and worship, and the other thing is youth. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so today I'm going to put on my worship pastor hat, okay? So forget youth pastor Nathan. He's left, he's gone, he's left the building. Uh, no, that's good, it's good, it's good. Um, and I'm not sure why Mitchell's mimicking my guitar playing, but it's good. It's good. I like it. Um, but today, we're going to have a little bit of a discourse around worship. Can you put up the first slide? So if you didn't know, the original word in the Old English uh, for worship was called worship, which uh, Angus says it sounds like somebody with a lisp trying to say worship. But that's sad, Angus. You shouldn't say that now. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He, he, was, he didn't say that. I, it was me, it was me, it was me. Um, so the OG, yeah, Old English was worship. And the kind of meaning of the original word before we got the word worship was worship. And the meaning is there. To give something worth, to demonstratively attribute value, especially to God. I, to demonstratively attribute value. Um, it, this is interesting to me, though. Because I, I, I like agree and then I also kind of disagree because we, to ascribe worth to God is like, yeah, 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 God is worth. And in fact, I believe that God is the only one worthy of worshiping. I think humans, like, uh, I saw a thing, maybe someone sent it to me. Was that you, Mark? Somebody sent me a reel the other day, and it was like Russell Brand talking about um, something that I actually, it wasn't Mark, okay, it was somebody, it was one of you. Uh, Russell Brand, of all people, saying that, hey, did you know that the Christian Bible says that um, basically that humans were made to worship uh, that they should only worship God. And he's like, what I understand that to mean is that uh, humans are made to worship. And if you don't worship God, you'll be worshiping something else. I believe that. I think that's true. I think we tend have a tendency to worship things. Whether you want to label it worship or not, I think we have a tendency to give our worship to things, right? Um, however, I think the worth that God has is not dependent on whether we worship or not. In fact, the Bible says that if, if we don't sing, then the rocks will cry out because God must be worshiped. Excuse my um, voice break just then, that was fine. If God must be worshiped, right? And so I don't think we give God worth when we worship him. He already has worth. He is worthy. But I think we ascribe the worth or we say when we worship, we say, God, you are worth or you are worthy of my worship, yeah? Okay, all right. We're going somewhere tonight. Uh, we're talking about... Perfume. Everyone say perfume. Uh, so a long time ago, we had some stalls out in here. I can't even remember what it was uh, for, uh, but some, somebody was fundraising for something. I love to support, you know, people that are fundraising, um, but don't come to me with your 40-hour famine. I don't have any money anymore. Um, but I love supporting people when they're fundraising. Nah, I will support you, your 40-hour famine. Don't even worry. Um, and so they were selling these, like, blueberry infusers, and I was like, man... I bet that smells mean. And I thought it smelled pretty nice, right? And so I bought this like blueberry infuser, but it was like quite like a cheap, like fake blueberry scent. And it was too strong for Ashley, right? And so I took it home and I like put it in, uh, where it was, in our room or something. And Ashley was just like, bro, that smell is making me gag. Can you please get rid of it? And so because I'm not very smart, I was like, I don't want to throw this out. You know, I'll put it in my car. And so I put it in my car and like, yeah. And so I, like, I was like, I'll chuck it in the glove box. She won't even know it's there. Like, but of course, as soon, like, then Ashley doesn't want to drive with me anymore. As soon as she hops into my car, she's like, eh. Eh. And I was like, bro, can you? And so the point of that, <laughs> don't make your wife mad. Just do whatever she says the first time. Um, this is good marriage advice for those that are considering marriage one day. Uh, today we're t unpacking a story about perfume that's not so much about perfume as much as it is about worship, and even more, a story about Jesus. Uh, this worship topic, and, and uh, like I will clarify for you, uh, I believe that 
something really special happens when the people of God get together and sing and praise God together. Um, and, I, and I think the times that we sing together are actually really unique. I don't know about you, but like this is a time in my week that's really special because it's a time where I'm focused on God. And like I'm not always focusing on God like really intensely like I am when we sing together. This is a, the, the singing together is like this beautiful picture of unity. But I will also say that worship, if you, if you only worship God through songs and nothing else, then I think you've missed the point. And I don't think our worship should start and begin with song. I think our songs should sing about what we do all the rest of the week, you know, and the God that we love. And we should love God by the way that we love people. Um, and and in, the same, in the same breath that we should love people all week and then turn up on Sunday and sing our hearts out to God, being like, God, I love you and this is real. This is real for me. And, that, and you are the reason that I love the people that curse me and hate me and actually hurt me. And, you are, and, and the nice people as well. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready for some, for some, for some scripture? Yes. yes. All right. Let's go. Let's go. I'm three coffees in. I think that's the problem. Okay. Mark 14, verse 3 to 9. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who previously had had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar. Everyone say beautiful. beautiful. Nice. Of expensive perfume. Everyone say expensive. expensive. Very nice. Nishia, I love it. Made from essence of nard. I don't know. Does anyone know what nard is? Nard me. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those were at the table. Some of those at the table were indignant. Does anyone know what indignant means? I think it means mad. Can anyone qualify that? Yeah, Sam says yes. All right, carry on. Why waste such an expensive perfume, they asked. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. But Jesus replied... Leave her alone. Why criticize her for doing such a good thing to me? You will always have the poor among you, but you can, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial ahead of time. I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. And I think this is really cool. Jesus is saying that throughout the world, people will talk about this story. And what are we doing tonight? We're talking about the story. Is that cool? Does anyone else think that's cool? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. We're remembering this, and we're discussing it together tonight. Uh, I think that's the end of it. Or is there one more? No, that's it. That's it. Okay, I'm going to pray. Uh, if you're from a live youth, you know what to do. Three, two, one. Nice. Uh, God, we thank you tonight for your, for your word, for the scriptures uh, that tell us the truth about your son, Jesus. We pray that we would not just learn some information tonight, but that we would encounter the living God in a real way, that as we unpack Scripture, that it would come alive to us, that your Holy Spirit would reveal to us the truth that we find. And it wouldn't be just a truth for us to know, but it would be a truth for us to live, that it would change the way that we worship, not just in song, but the way that we love people, every person, good people, bad people, whatever people, we're all actually bad people, but that we would love everyone. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen, amen. Okay, the first point. We've got three points tonight. Um, Joe Green's not here, so he won't criticize me for always having three points. But I promise you, it's actually really good mnemonics. You can't remember more than three things. I promise that. I promise you that. Uh, the first point is bring something of value. Okay, uh, what, did, what did the Bible say about the alabaster jar? It was... Yes, expensive, and it was beautiful, right? Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon. While he's eating, a woman came with a beautiful alabaster jar with expensive perfume. Uh, a beautiful jar of expensive perfume. Her worship was made all the more meaningful as she brought something of great worth to God. Can I challenge you tonight not to give Jesus your leftovers, but to bring, bring a sacrifice, bring something of worth to God as you, as you come to worship? In doing so, she ascribed value to Jesus. She's saying, you are worth this. You are worth more than this. This is all I have, but you're, you're worth this and more. A little while ago, uh, we were having trouble with our worship team members consistently turning up late to rehearsals and services. And so at one of our team meetings, I said to the team, <laughs> uh, yeah, this was a long time ago. The team's really good now. Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some late people tonight that are laughing, but you guys are good. You guys are normally really good. Um, and I said to the team, isn't it interesting that we turn up on time to work because that's for money, but we turn up late to church because that's just for God? And there was like a little bit of a sting and a little bit of burn. And, and if, it's, uh, if, it's, if I'm shaming you, throw that shame away. That's not my intention. But if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, 
honor God with turning up on time. I would love that. That would be really helpful, actually. Um, and then somebody put up their hand and they were like, what if we're late for both? And I was like, oh, that's like no help to me, but that's fine. <laughs> I can't remember who that was. I think, oh no, I think I do. I think I do. But we don't name and shame here most of the time. Oh no, I touched a button and it moved. <laughs> Our worship is qualified as we offer to God something of value. We see this demonstrated not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. Uh, as God commands, uh, if, has anyone heard of the man David in the Old Testament? He, he says, David, I want you to build an altar, which is essentially like uh, this, this kind of thing that's made for worship, right? I want you to build an altar. And, and, and this guy comes along, King Aruna. As I don't know how to pronounce names. I've only read it, seen it written down, you know. Uh, and this guy Aruna, King Aruna, uh, no, this not not a king, Aaron. He says to David, "Hey, I'll pay for all the the animal sacrifices that you're gonna make." And David's response is is is, is on the screen. He says, "David, the king, replied to Aaron." No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. There's something in this for us. I'm not gonna. I'm not just gonna give God my leftovers. I'm not just gonna come and give something that's like half baked, right? But actually, I'm, I'm not going to give God something that costs me nothing because actually I'm going to bring a sacrifice of praise. I'm going to bring something that's worth. And this is the same thing that we see in the story that we've just been reading. It was a beautiful jar of expensive perfume. She's like, this has great value, but you have more value. And so I bring it to you and I offer it to you. God will call each of us to offer something of value to him in worship. And for so many of us, tithing's a struggle because money has value to us. And that's why it's, that's why it's hard. But that sacrifice brings meaning to our worship as we offer something of value. But it's about so much more than money. Sometimes worship costs us our time. Sometimes it costs us our energy. Sometimes our empathy. Sometimes the greatest way you can worship God is by being empathetic to the person that's sitting next to you or across from you. Sometimes our worship looks like forgiving the people that hurt us. And anyone that's chosen to forgive will know that forgiveness is emotionally expensive. Forgiveness is emotionally expensive. If you haven't caught it yet, I'm, I'm talking about worship that goes far beyond songs and affects the way that we love people. Uh, but the fact that this was expensive is not to say that you have to be rich to worship God. That is not the message of this at all. It's not like, oh, God is expecting like a $3,000 payment from everyone. And if you can't pay up, you can't worship God. There have been times in history where the church has tried to do things like that. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's not the gospel. It's not the way. Remember Jesus talking about, or is it Jesus talking about the woman with the two pennies? And she's like, he, and, and he's like, she's given more. It's not about the amount. It has nothing to do with the amount. It's about the sacrifice. That's really what, uh, where worship starts and finishes. Um, in verse eight, Jesus says, she has done what she could. It's not... He's not, he's not asking for more than you can, right? He's asking for what you can, but make it a sacrifice. Bring, bring a sacrifice. Um, I feel, also feel the need to clarify this statement uh, in verse 7. Uh, have you got that there, Mark? Yeah. You will always have the poor among you, and you can help them whenever you want to, but you will not always have me. Don't read this. Okay, yeah, don't read this and be like, oh, I found an excuse not to like love and care for poor people. It's in the Bible. We should just not do it, Right? The, the best way, and they, really the only proper way to read Scripture, is to read it in, in its context and in the context of the whole Bible. Scripture interprets Scripture. I challenge you to read the whole Bible and find nothing that talks about loving poor people. And you won't be able to. There's verses everywhere, uh, especially in the New Testament, especially Jesus. Luke 4, verse 18. Uh, Jesus reads from the prophet Isaiah, and he says, uh, Luke 4, verse 18, Yeah, good news to the poor. He's like, my, my gospel is good news to the poor. And in Matthew 25, he says that whatever we do for the hungry and the naked, we do for Jesus. And so I'll just say that this is not saying don't love poor people. In fact, I think our love for Jesus should really affect the way that we love people that are in marginalized situations totally. I think this was a specific moment in time where like Jesus's body was there. He was about to go to the cross and she did this beautiful thing that had this like metaphoric like uh, story that was like pointing to the cross, anointed for burial, right? And if Jesus' literal body was 
right here in front of us, maybe we would like do something special to like honor and acknowledge that. But his body is gone and his spirit has come. And so what he's asking us to do now is not to pour perfume over his literal body, but to pour worship out on the world and say, actually, I'm gonna love people because God loved me. I'm gonna love people because Jesus laid down his life, so I'm gonna lay down mine. That's what our worship looks like. So don't leave here and be like, Nathan said I don't have to love poor people. I didn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. You're lying. Love the poor, love the widow, love the orphan. Love our, our whanau and our co-workers. Uh, ask God for opportunities to love radically. I'd ask God for the resource to give generously, whether that's time, money, energy, or whatever. Ask God for the boldness to take opportunities where we see it and uh, where we see in front of us to love people radically. I feel like that didn't make sense but you can make sense of that in Jesus' name. The second point, bring your worship to Jesus. So this is like the most obvious thing, but it's also, I feel like it really bears, like is worth saying. Where did the woman with the alabaster jar pour out her worship? Or on whom, rather? Jesus, Jesus right? Okay, and I feel like if we had like a modern rendition of this story and it was like not the Bible, she would have just poured the perfume on herself because I feel like that's the message that we get so much from like social media and in the famous words of uh, Donna, is it, from Parks and Rec and she's like, treat yourself. I feel like that is like so common, like an ideal ideology now and social media is like, you know, you're just like, it's just about you. Like just look after you, just like treat yourself, you know. Uh, and that's what she would have done if, she, if, the, if, the, if they retold the story and it, and it was like sponsored by TikTok or whatever, right? But that's not what happens. And I want to say, uh, you should love yourself and I, you should definitely, and I'm all about like self-care and I'm in a process of like learning how to look after myself a little bit better. I'm going back to the gym, praise the Lord, right? Yeah, okay, biggest hallelujah yet, but that's right. Um, you should, yeah, uh, the point being, love yourself, yes. Honor others, yes, but save your worship for Jesus and Jesus alone, because only he is worthy of worshiping. If you take one look in the mirror and you'll realize that, that there is faults there, right? That that is not perfection. See other people, get close to anyone, and you'll realize that, that they are not perfect. Look at the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, and realize he alone is worthy of worship. And so I want to just challenge you tonight to bring your worship to Jesus. Make sure it is Jesus that you're worshiping. This might seem obvious, but I, I believe it does be a statement, a uh, be a stating. A little while ago, I, I, uh, I read a book called uh, Good or God, and the premise was that some Christians, some people that believe in God will not be caught out by the sin that's like obviously evil, like murder. They're like, oh, whoopsies, like I murdered someone. Oh man, it was an accident, right? So, you know, if that's your struggle, like I will definitely pray for you. But but just as the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden looked good, some of us are gonna stumble on things that look good but aren't of God or aren't bringing glory to God. And so I wanna challenge you tonight and say, um, there's this poet and theologian and songwriter that I love and he puts it like this, anything that I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can't stop thinking about is an idol. And anything I give all my love is an idol, right? Uh, so I, I, sh I shared this message uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, at a church down in Christchurch. Uh, I went to visit Sam Young, and he said, hey, do you wanna come share in my church? I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so um, I shared this message, and yeah, this, this young guy came up to me afterwards, and he, and he was like, how do I know like, if something in my life is an idol? Um, and he was like, you know, I like, I really love cars. It, like, how do I know if that's an idol? Not Mitchell car, like, like you know, drivey cars. Um, and he was like, I really love cars. And he's like, I really love like bodybuilding and like, like I'm trying to like, you know, sculpt, you know, all of this. And I was like, that's really cool. Like, go, go you, me too, me too. And um, he was like, how do I know if that's an idol? And, and I thought about it for a second. And I just said to him, hey, if, if there's anything in your life that God asked you to give up and you could not, then I'd say maybe there's some, there's some worship there that's, that's going to that thing instead of Jesus, you know? Maybe you love that more than you love Jesus. And I would challenge you to believe that nothing in this world is worth worshiping as much as Jesus is. That if anything else in your life has got the throne of your heart, boot it, like kick it off. 
put Jesus there. Only he is worthy. Look after yourself and honors, honor others, but save your worship for Jesus. And if there's something taking your love and your adoration, then I pray that God would give you the strength to lay it down and put Jesus back on the throne. The last point as the band comes uh, is break your alabaster jar. Everyone say, break your alabaster jar. So good. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. This. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. I love that the story isn't that she like came with her bottle and she like took like gently like took the lid off and like just like little little dab not that dab, like this dab, and like a little dab on Jesus and then closed up the bottle and like took it back home again. Like she broke the jar and poured it out. How many know that if you smash your jar, are you gonna get that perfume back in the jar again? Right? If you didn't know, I'm telling you now, and now you know, or in three seconds you'll know, the Christian faith isn't a gently take the lid off and pour a little bit out and put the lid back on kind of faith. It's a break the box open and give it all kind of faith. The Bible tells us these stories, and if you, if you uh, I challenge you to read the book of Acts, right? And you're going to read these stories where um, our Christian brothers and sisters, our Christian ancestors who, who carried the faith after Jesus left, they gave it all for God. So many of them. There's these stories of these people dying. I remember Ashley and I reading through the book of Acts, and, we, and we're reading about this guy, Stephen. And I was like, man, this guy, Stephen's awesome. And he's like doing this like amazing speech. And Ashley's like, yeah, it's a shame like he dies in the next chapter. And I was like, oh, spoilers. But, right, but, but the crazy thing to me is these guys were all in kind of faith. These guys were like, break the box open, pour it all out, have everything. When, 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 they, when they were pushed down and they were like, we'll kill you if you don't deny Jesus. They said, no, nah, I can't. I believe this. I believe this is true. In life and in death, I will honor Jesus and Jesus alone. I will not bow down to your king. I will only bow down to King Jesus. Can we not be the people who love God on Sunday and hate people Monday through Saturday? We believe that every person is made in the image of God and therefore holds this intrinsic value that cannot be taken away. And God calls us to love them. Probably the best message I ever heard on tithing was a pastor that said, God doesn't want your 10%. He wants it all. Sure, give 10% of your money to the church, but spend the other 90% honoring God and loving people as well. Jesus didn't take 10% to the cross. He gave it all. And he invites us into this radical faith that places every second that we live at the feet of Jesus, every dollar, all our energy, all our love, and says to Jesus, this, this life, is my offering, my worship. Take my life and use it for your glory and to build your kingdom. If I'm totally honest, uh, the last 12 months has been actually really hard um, and I've been probably not in the best place. Uh, it's been tough on me and my family and we've experienced some of the uh, weight and difficulty and frustrations that come with uh, like full-time ministry. Uh, and there's been definitely moments where I wanted to pa uh, give up and pack it in, call it a day, take it all back. But what I keep coming back to is that Jesus has done too much for me to walk away now. This is not to say that I shouldn't try and change some of the things that are dysfunctional in my life and happening around me. But at the same time, what I will say is that I don't believe that the answer is for me to try and take my life back and live it my way. Because I don't think that works either. And what I'm coming to realize and uh, what I've been sharing with people close to me is that uh, I need to hand over to God my ministry, my family, my time, my life, and ask Him to do with it what He pleases. The times that I get weighed down is where I treat the, sorry, I'm putting my youth has, ha, pastor hat back on for a second, treat the youth ministry like it's my ministry, like it, like it lives and breathes because of me, like I'm like the central thing to it. I'm not central to the youth ministry. I don't own that youth ministry. I don't own the wonderful high schoolers that we get to hang out with on a Tuesday night and a Friday night. So much more than that's our youth ministry, that's God's youth ministry. And if it's gonna succeed, it's not gonna be because of Nathan Bird. It's not gonna be because Nathan Bird showed up. It's gonna be because Jesus showed up and started changing some young people's lives and showing them the truth about his love and his word and showed them a better way to live. Ultimately, I believe the Bible when it says that God's ways are higher than my ways, that His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. 
and that he knows better than what I, he knows better than I do what I need and he loves me completely. And so I wonder if there's some of us in the room today that feel like that we're holding back from God some things and we actually need to just break the alabaster jar and surrender everything to Jesus again. Maybe there's a part of your life, like if your life was a house, maybe there's a room in your house where Jesus doesn't go. I don't invite Jesus into that room. I just keep that one separate. Maybe there's a part of your life that you don't let Jesus into. Can I challenge you to break open that part of your life at the feet of Jesus today? There's forgiveness and there's healing in Jesus' presence and there's renewing and there's wholeness there too. You couldn't possibly to be too broken for God to do something supernatural in your life. You couldn't possibly be bad enough for the grace of God to supersede your sin. I can promise you that. There's forgiveness and healing in Jesus' presence and there's renewing and wholeness of, uh, there as well. So as we wrap up and bring things to a close, in our worship, can we bring something of value, bring a sacrifice to God as we bring to Him our worship, not just in moments of musical singing, but in our whole life? If Jesus has done anything for you, anything significant, if you believe Jesus has changed your life, live like it. Bring your worship to Jesus. Make sure that there's nothing else sitting on the altar of your life, on the throne of your life. And can I challenge everyone again, break the alabaster jar. Be, be in this all in radical kind of faith. Don't be the half in, toe in the water kind of Christian. I'm telling you, give him everything and you'll never regret it.